I'd like for you to join me tonight uh, in the scripture by turning, please, to Romans chapter 7. Romans 7. <clears throat> Once you find it, I want to bring your attention to begin with to verse 6. Romans 7, verse 6, where we read these words. What shall we say then? Is the law sin? God forbid. Nay or no, I had not known sin but by the law. For I had not known lust, except the law had said, Thou shalt not covet. That's verse 7. Jump up to verse 6. But now we are delivered from the law that being dead wherein we were held, that we should serve in the newness of the spirit and not in the oldness of the letter. I want you to see that phraseology in the second part of verse 6 specifically. <clears throat> we should serve in the newness of the spirit and not in the oldness of the letter. You know, there are two ways for believers to attempt to seek to live a victorious Christian life. Many try to do that the old way. They try to live victoriously by the old way of keeping the law, by keeping a set of rules. If not the law of Moses, their own standards, their own set of rules. But when we focus on the old, when we focus on rules, your version, whatever it might be, instead of on the newness of the Spirit, instead of on Jesus, it's deadly. Spiritually, it's deadly. Because a law focus kills. And that's what these verses that follow tell us. Verse 8 but sin, taking occasion by the commandment, by the law, wrought in me all manner of concupiscence, that's evil desire. For without the law, sin was dead. I was alive without the law once, but when the law, when the commandment came, sin lived, revived, and I died. And, the, and so very clearly he says, the commandment which was ordained to life, I found to be unto death. Because sin, taking occasion by the, by the law, by the commandment, deceived me, and it slew me, it killed me. I want to have a word of prayer with you before we go any further, but I want you to think about this. If you're trying to live a victorious life by keeping a set of rules, by keeping commandments, if you have a law focus, it's deadly. It kills. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, I want to thank you for just the simple and yet profound truth here in these verses. And I pray that it would not only be something that would be understood by each one of us, but rather it would go further than that, and it would begin to really make a difference in our life, that we would change our focus from the law to Christ, and that we would see that there's only victory in him, and not by any effort that we exert to try to live what we think is a Christian life by a standard or a set of do's and don'ts. I just pray, Lord, that you'd make this abundantly clear and, uh, and applicable to our daily living, that we would not live in discouragement and defeat any longer, but in the victory that we've sung about and that this passage uh, uh, longs for. We pray this for Jesus' sake. Amen. So a law focus kills. You need a right focus 
when it comes to living a victorious Christian life, you need a right focus. And you know what the right focus is? It's Jesus, and it's loving him. If you'll simply set your, your sights on loving Jesus, you'll be on the right track. Because look at what verse 7 says in Romans chapter 7. It basically tells us what the purpose of the law that God gave is. The law, notice what he says, the law reveals sin. I would not have known that thou shalt that, that coveting was sin unless the law said it. The law reveals sin. And that word reveal is very important. The law of God never removes sin. It simply reveals sin. And a law focus will kill is deadly because it details sin and failure in our life. The law is simply meant to be used as you would use a mirror. When you look into the mirror, you get a an accurate reflection of yourself. And the law is to reflect ourselves so that we see ourselves as we really are. So if you're looking to the law, if you're looking to a code, a set of rules to follow in order to live victorious Christian life, you're looking in the mirror, it's very discouraging. Because the law is only meant to reveal sin and not remove it. Look at the next few verses. We already read verses 8 to 11. And let me just sum up what those verses are about. Those verses tell us that not only does the law reveal sin in us, but sin in us rebels against the law. <laughs> that is, the commandments that, uh, that come to our attention that we... That, that we become aware of, that indwelling sin in us rebels against those rules, rebels against those laws. What Paul is saying in these verses 8 to 11 is that before, uh, without the law, sin is powerless. It has nothing to rebel against. But a law focus kills because what what uh what it does to indwelling sin, sin uses the law to produce sinful desires in us. It's like seeing that sign. I think it, I, I saw it tonight over in the annex in the kitchen there. There's a sign on the cabinet that says wet paint. When you see a sign like that, what do you want to do? You want to see just how wet it is, right? That, but you know, that's humorous, but this isn't. What Paul is saying is, when God says, thou shalt not, when God gives commandments, sin is in us, indwelling sin. It's, it's like personified in Romans chapter 6 and 7. Sin is personified. It's really uh, what resides in our flesh, in, in these bodies. It, sin rebels against the law. And there is that pull of sin in us. There is that, that uh, influence of sin that dwells in us, that urges us to commit sin. I think that's what Paul means when he says what he does in 1 Corinthians 15, 56, that uh, the strength of sin is the law. Law, actually, the, the law of, uh, it, that sin rebels against it, and it and Christians then yield to the sin that pulls, with, that, that pulls within them. And the moment that we do so, what he says in, in um, verse 8, 9, uh, 10, and 11 is that we partner with deadliness. He says it in so many ways. Without the law, sin was dead. But when the law came, sin revived, and I died. I found the commandment to be unto death, he says. Sin, by the commandment, deceived me and killed me, slew me. And so 
the moment that we partner with sin, it's deadly. That doesn't mean that you lose your salvation, but it means that uh, it's death as far as the spirit-filled life is concerned. It's death as far as pleasing God is concerned. It's deadly. There's in verses 12 and 13, let's read them. Wherefore the law is holy, the commandment is holy and just and good. Well, was then that which is good made death unto me? God forbid. But sin, that it might appear sin, working death in me, sin working death in me, by that which is good, the law, that sin by the commandment might become exceeding sinful. What's he saying? He's saying that sin uses the law. Indwelling sin uses the law of God in us to get uh, to, to condemn us. A law focus kills because sin uses the righteous, the holy, the good law of God to condemn us. Now, the second point that I want to bring out from this seventh chapter of Romans, you know, the seventh chapter of Romans is kind of depressing because it is, uh, it's, I think it's a personal autobiography of uh, the Apostle Paul before he put into, uh, put into practice the spirit-filled life, which he talks about in Romans chapter 8. You know, there, in Romans chapter 7, there's only one reference to the Spirit in the whole chapter, and that is in that sixth verse where we are to serve in the newness of the Spirit. But when you get to Romans chapter 8, the Holy Spirit is mentioned eight or 19 times in that chapter. But what does that tell you? So he's dealing with, this is what happens. We self-sabotage. We sabotage ourselves when we make our focus the law because it kills. It kills the spirit-filled life. It kills a victorious Christian life. It's deadly to it. And so in verses 14 through the rest of the chapter, 14 through 24 actually, he's going to tell us this. Not, not only does the law focus kill, but that involves self-effort, and self-effort fails. A law focus, if you focus on doing, if you focus on doing, 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 if you focus on a list of rules, if you focus to live by, if you focus on the commandments, a law focus always leads to self-effort where you depend upon your willpower to be victorious. And you might have more willpower than I have, but none of us has enough willpower to live a victorious Christian life. Self-effort. Law focus leads to self-effort. It always does. And isn't it interesting that 25 times in Romans chapter 7, Paul uses the pronoun I, I. I, I, it's self-effort that he's talking about here. Self-effort fails. In fact, in verse 14, here's why. <clears throat> he says, for we know that the law is spiritual, but I, I'm carnal, sold under sin. What he's saying is simply this, self-effort will lead you to self-indulgence. Sold under sin, he says. Self-effort leads to self-indulgence. That's an interesting word, sold under sin. I looked it up, and it has to do with trafficking. It's like when you exercise self-effort, it will lead to self-indulgence to you becoming a sin slave, you'll be trafficked in sin. You'll have absolutely no control. You think you do, but you'll end up 
just living for gratification, self-indulgence. You have control over yourself? Are you able to say no? Not if you're depending upon yourself. Self-effort will always fail you. Not only does self-effort involve gratification, self-indulgence, but it also involves frustration. Listen to what he says about it in verse 15 and following. <clears throat> For that which I do, I allow not. For that what I would, that I do not. What I hate, that I do. If I do that which I would not, I consent that the law is good. Now it's no more I that do it, but that indwelling sin in me. For I know that in me, that is in my flesh, dwells no good thing. For will, the, the will is there, but how to make it happen, how to perform it, I can't figure that out. I find not. For the good that I want to do, I don't do. But the evil that I don't want to do, that's what I end up doing, is what he says in verse 19. So it's frustrating. The law, a law focus always leads to self-effort, and self-effort will 100% of the time fail and lead to frustration. Self-effort is imitation. You imitate a Christian life. If you're living based upon your willpower, uh, if you're living based upon your ability, your self-effort, you're just imitating the Christian life. It's not the real thing. It's not the real Christian life because we're not the ones that live the Christian life. We need the life of Jesus in us to impart his life in and through us. You don't imitate the life of Christ you get the life of Christ imparted to you. And if you don't have that, if you're imitating it, you're frustrated. You're going to be a constant failure. You're not going to live a victorious Christian life. There's going to be a growing feeling of total frustration. That's what he's talking about in verses 15 through 19. <clears throat> and then there's going to be confusion. Look at verse 20. Now, if I do that I would not, if I do the things I don't want to do, it's no more I that do it, but indwelling sin. It's sin that dwells in me. It's not I, but sin. In other words, that is not who I am. It's confusion. It's a case of stolen identity. It's uh, identity theft. It's indwelling sin, and it's not me. That's not who I am. It's not the real me. Because who are you as a believer? Well, you are a regenerated, you have a regenerated human spirit. You have become a partaker of the divine nature. You have God, the Holy Spirit himself, joined to your human spirit so that your human spirit cannot sin because God is in it and he can't sin. And so you have to depend upon him. And if you depend upon him, you won't sin. That's exactly what John says in 1 John chapter 3 and verse 6. He said, Whosoever abideth or depends upon him sinneth not. So there's confusion that is the result of self-effort. Not I, but sin. That's not who you are. You're not the sinner that you used to be. You're now a person with Christ in you. And then look at the oppression that he feels in verses 21 through 24. He says, I find in a law that when I would do good, evil is present with me. I delight in the law of God in my innermost being, in my spirit, in my inner man. 
But at the same time, I see another law in my members, in my flesh, in my body. And that law is the law of sin, and it's warring against the law of my mind, my spirit. And it's bringing me into captivity to the law of sin, which is in my body. Oh, wretched man that I am, who shall deliver me from the body of this death? There's that oppression. Self-effort leads to failure. And that failure is sin. And sin leads you into bondage. And when you realize the bondage that you're in as a believer, it brings despair. And it prompts you to cry as Paul cries out in verse 24, O wretched man that I am, who shall deliver me from the body of this death? Who will deliver me? You see, believers have been pardoned from sin. We understand that. But so many believers need to be delivered from sin. They've been pardoned, but they've never enjoyed deliverance. And they think that deliverance comes through self-effort. But, but self-effort always fails. The victory is only ours when, by faith, we take the provision of Christ in you. And he says in verse 25, I thank God through Jesus Christ our Lord. That's who delivers me from this body of death. Christ our Lord, Jesus Christ our Lord, and so I thank him. I take him, and I thank him. Just as you thank anyone that gives you a gift, you take him as that gift, and you thank him, and you begin to depend upon him, on his spirit of Christ in you, and instead of being self-reliant and, and ending in defeat, you become dependent upon the Spirit of God, and he brings you deliverance from sin. And instead of, of uh, self-indulgence, the Holy Spirit produces in you self-control. And instead of frustration, the Holy Spirit brings joy in your heart. And instead of being confused about your spiritual identity, you have the peace of knowing that you are his and he is yours, and you enjoy deliverance, and you're set free from this kind of spiritual bondage that he cries out of in verse 23 and 24. Let me close with this illustration. If you've been confused up to this point, I hope that this will clear it up. Let's say that you're, you're driving your car, uh, and you see someone with their car pulled over on the shoulder on the side of the road. And so out of concern, uh, you pull over and you ask what the problem is. And they tell you, well, we ran, I, I ran out of gas. And you say, no problem. You open your trunk and you have a tow rope. And so you hook up the rope to uh, the car and you tow this guy to the nearest gas station. And when you get there, he, he reaches into his pocket and opens his wallet and he doesn't have any money in it. And so you say, no problem. Uh, and you, you take out uh, cash or credit card and you pay to have his gas tank filled. And the guy is just, he's falling all over himself, profusely thanking you for all the help that you've given him uh, and promising to, to repay you. And so you get in your car. And as you start out of that gas station, you look in your rearview mirror and you see this guy behind his vehicle struggling to push it. And you think, what in the world's wrong with him? That is a stupid, but yet really a good illustration of how most Christians try to live their lives. As believers, by the Spirit of God, we've been given a car with a full tank of gas, but we're struggling to push it. We're struggling to push it every day, and we end up emotional uh, basket cases 
and we end up uh, angry and bitter and and just wanting to give up on the Christian life. Wake up. You're pushing your car that has a full tank of gas that would run perfectly if you would just depend upon uh, the the mechanism instead of depending upon your yourself to push it. You're supposed to sit in the car and let it carry you. You're supposed to depend upon Christ in you and let him carry you through every situation moment by moment in your daily life. A law focus, a focus on do's and don'ts, will kill. It's deadly. To spiritual life, it's deadly. It kills spiritual living. And a law focus always leads to self-effort. And self-effort always fails. And you'll end up discouraged, despairing, and not wanting to even live a Christian life. I can't do it. When you get to that point when you realize you can't do it, that's probably the best point you've ever been at. Because when you can't do it, then you come to the realization, I can't, but he can. And you start depending upon him. 